everybody. Welcome to episode two of Legal Muscle, starring Rick Collins, Esquire. Rick Collins has been a contributor to Muscular Development Magazine for over 20 years. He's the author of the best-selling book, Legal Muscle. He's a senior partner at the firm Collins, Gann, McCloskey, McCloskey and Barry, PLLC. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That's at steroidlaw.com for those uh-oh moments. Instagram, Rick Collins, ESQ for Esquire. He's also the president of the Nassau County Bar Association for all you other attorneys out there. Please welcome from the Empire State of New York, Rick Collins, yeah. Esquire. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Good to be back. Uh, this, is, this is a great thing. We should have done this a long time ago. I've been writing for MD for this is my 20th year of, I, I think, am I the longest running columnist at MD? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Wow. And, and Steve is great. Steve lets me write, you know, I think he, I hope he reads them, but he, you know, he does, he does. Uh, he does, he comments on them, but, uh, but he lets me write basically anything. So it's, it's steroids, it's dietary supplements, it's sports nutrition, it's culture and, and, you know, how the fitness community should think about different issues that are in the news, uh, mm -hmm. political issues, cultural issues, social issues. And so I've really had the ability to write these columns. And this is just, you know, an opportunity that, that makes sense to be able to put into video form the recent columns that I did and for us to be able to sort of talk about them and, uh, and hash out some of the ideas in the columns. Yeah, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity because I read these things and sometimes I want to engage with you and talk about it, but it's in a magazine, I can't. So a couple of recent columns. I want to start with this one because this is a subject I feel pretty strongly about. I'm sure any fit person does. It was called fat shaming or fat acceptance. So you start off with some stats. We know that two thirds of the United States population is overweight. 40% of them are clinically obese with a body mass index over 30. And uh, we know the health, the health issues that can result from being overweight and especially obese, blood pressure being high, high cholesterol, type two diabetes, heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis, sleep apnea, and they're at an increased re risk of death from all other causes, including cancer, things like that. And uh, I believe your column was in response to this recent movement to accept obesity. Uh, it's a fat acceptance movement. <clears throat> we saw Cosmopolitan magazine with a couple of con a controversial cover that they had a couple versions of with big, big plus size models. And it's the tag, the big cover line was, this is healthy. Right. which is, that's like pointing at the blue sky and saying, this is orange. It's not, it's blue. Right. Uh, man, so first of all, what, what, what inspired you to write this column? So look, you, know, all you me, probably most of the listeners and, and, and viewers on this are, are fitness-oriented people. We spend a lot of time in the gym. We spend a lot of time on nutritional choices. Hopefully we make good eating choices um, so from our perspective, you know, to, to see a cover that says this is healthy and, you know, knowing what we know and how much we invest in trying to stay fit, trying to stay lean, um, just seemed to me to be a disconnect. Yeah. And so uh, one of the things I did was I wrote the column and I actually posted on my Instagram a little meme that was showed the cover of Cosmo, which was a, a, a large woman in a, a kind of a ballet style type of pose or something with the tagline, this is healthy. And the meme was basically saying, you know, challenging that and saying, this is not healthy. Um, and that's not to say that it's not beautiful. There was, you know, beauty is a completely different issue and attractiveness and you know, that, that's in the eye of the beholder, right? You know, yeah, so yeah. we may look at a, a muscular, you know, Mr. Olympia competitor and say, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good way to look. And people in the non-fitness community might have a very different perspective on that. So none of this is talking about beauty or attractiveness. It's really just health. But somehow I think that they've become intertwined as part of maybe the social justice movement and, and the idea that, you know, anything that is a bad fact about somebody who might be in any way marginalized um, is a personal attack. 
yeah. on yeah. their self-worth, their self-esteem, you know, everything, how, how the, the society views them. And, and look, let's, let's also be fair that people who have been very overweight have been the subject of various social attacks. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a, a, an easy way to go through life in, in many ways. And it's sometimes associated with eating disorders. And some of those eating disorders are also associated with past trauma, right. with childhood abuse. I mean, so before we judge people and just you know poke fun at somebody, um, which is something we should never do. Um, you know, walk a, while, a mile in that person's shoes, and and before you can do that. But yeah, and you, but I right. So I posted the, the the meme just to say, look, you know, there is objective reality, and objective reality says, for all the reasons you just said, and I cited in the column, it's not healthy to have a BMI of of forty generally. You know, some of us bodybuilders may have BMIs that make us technically obese uh, because of the amount of muscle that we carry. Right. But that's not really what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. So um, so it's not healthy. And so I posted that and it was interesting because most of my followers like yours are people in the fitness community, nutrition people, fitness people, uh, many of them are registered dietitians or nutritionists or personal trainers or competitive bodybuilders themselves, some recreational bodybuilders also. And so there was a lot of consensus that this isn't healthy. Right. Um, but, but because it was public and on Instagram, it did bring out some folks from the other perspective. And it was interesting to see there were people from the you might call it the, the weight diversity group, or there's even a, a group called the fat pride group, um, sort of the fat acceptance folks who are moving as part of the social justice movement forward the agenda to for more acceptance of health at any weight. You could be any weight and, and still be healthy. And the science doesn't support that, you know, from an emotional standpoint, from a social justice standpoint, it would be nice if it were true, but, but it's not true. Um, and so there was some fireworks that, that happened. It was probably one of the most um, commented upon uh, things I've posted I've ever made on, on Instagram. Um, was it reported? And, what's that? Did people report your posts as hate speech or anything like that? It was not reported because, because the post, yeah, look, I was, very careful in posting. Nobody wants to be canceled these days, right? No, no. So I, I was really emphasized kindness and patience and respect above all things for everybody's self worth. But that, but that we also have to agree on that that there are certain facts, and those facts are based on science. And and you can't, you know, even though they may be difficult or challenging for a person, we can't really ignore them. And so uh, there was some fireworks on there. It was interesting to see how the social justice movement has been adopted by, you know, the the fat acceptance movement and you know, and fat pride movement. And and so my column was was essentially about there's also fat shaming, right? And mm -hmm. and fat shaming is the opposite of that, right? And and that's kind of like what we talked about before is that, you know making fun of, uh, even even condescending or what are sort of helpful uh, comments can be interpreted by somebody who's highly sensitive to these issues in a way that actually backfires. So fat shaming doesn't work. Fat shaming doesn't make people stop eating. You know, if, if somebody has an eating disorder and their problem is based on eating issues, you know, making them sad and, and feel terrible about themselves will make them depressed anxious and ultimately backfire and make them eat more. So, so the column kind of explained all of that. And, and I think that instead of this sort of binary approach to things, one is good and one is bad. It's either fat acceptance or it's fat pride. Yeah. We, we shouldn't be necessarily, fat acceptance or, or fat shaming rather. Right. We shouldn't necessarily you know, be accepting that 
people are healthy at any weight because you can reach a weight where you're just not healthy. That, that's the reality. On the other hand, shaming people because of it is completely unacceptable as well. And so we shouldn't be doing that. And we should find a way of embracing people's self-worth without shaming them, but also trying to encourage better eating habits and doing what we can to support people to reach a healthier lifestyle. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I don't want anyone to feel badly about themselves. And I've seen people bullied and teased and it's not cool. It's, it's, it's tough to see. And I feel terribly for anyone who's had to endure that. But at the same time, you know, America in particular has a huge problem with childhood obesity. You know, I remember I'm, I'm, a, I'm roughly your age. When I was a kid, there'd be like one or two fat kids, we call them at school. That was it. Um, you know, as I became a parent and started going to my kids' school functions, I see more and more heavy kids, big, really big kids, kids that are technically already obese by, you know, middle school, and they're headed for serious, serious health problems. Because as you say, you can't deny the statistics, the science. The one thing I always say to people is, have you ever seen uh, an old person who was morbidly obese? No, of course. They never lived that long. Right. You know, they typically die between 40 and 55 anyone who's morbidly obese. So, uh, you know, I think that's, we do need to figure out ways to change behaviors, change eating habits, because if we're at two thirds of America's overweight now, can you imagine 20 years from now, especially yeah. where kids, everyone's stuck indoors now. These kids don't go out and play anymore. They're all on their, their gaming and, and phones and what they, they don't go out and play like we did, ride bikes and climb trees. So if we don't do something, it's the, I can't even imagine 40, 50 years from now, what, what this, uh, what the society is going to look like physically. Right. Yeah. I mean, certainly part of it is this, the safetyism, you know, this, this safety generation that we have where we're so concerned about kids hurting themselves or, or, you know, being involved in a physical activity that might have some level of risk that we've reduced physical activity to the point where, you know, yeah, the, the physical activity is mostly thumbs, you know, and, and that, that's, that's not healthy, right? Uh, there's also a class component to this. I mean, obviously, if you look at back in the Middle Ages, the people who were very obese were the rich people, yes. the wealthiest, because they had access to large amounts of food, they could consume it, and they became huge. And the poor people were very skinny, you know, they, they just were, were you know, the food insecure were the thinnest people. Yeah. And that's obviously flipped around. And so now the heaviest people uh, are often the people on the lowest socioeconomic strata of the society mm -hmm. because bad food is cheap, right? right. Good, right. healthy food is expensive. You know, uh, if you're shopping at Whole Foods, you can't walk out of there without a white eye rollback, right? We so call it, we call it whole, whole foods. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm not looking to be by anybody, but the reality is, you know, the, the cheapest food is fast food. It's stuff you can grab and, and it's, um, it's the worst for you. And I think that's certainly part of what's happening in terms of obesity for people who are marginalized in terms of income. Yeah, it's, I often say this, and it's probably not even accurate, but I say America is the only country where even the poor people are fat. And there's probably other countries where that rings true. But, uh, geez, I, 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 you see these videos from third world countries. These right. people, some of them are skin and bones walking around right. looking for scraps in junkyards to eat. Food insecurity has a different look in other places. Correct. So uh, we're going to move on to the next one because you did another one. And this is, geez, my whole life I've often wondered when I, when I saw people, especially heinous criminals, murderers, uh, rapists on trial, and I saw their counselors, I sort of looked down at them and said, how could, and your column is called, how can you defend these people and that, these, yeah. those people? And that's what I always thought. How can this person, this, this attorney, sit there next to a client who slaughtered people or raped and tortured and done all these right. horrendous things? So you did a column about that explaining because, you know, you did You've been a defense attorney your entire career, and you started off as a public defender defending. Is that so, not true? So actually, I started my career as a prosecutor. prosecutor. So I started the career on the other side. 
Uh-huh. And so I put the bad guys in jail, right? Oh, okay. um, and so I did that for five years. And then I, look, it, you're on a salary, it's a, you, you would have a great pension, but you're not really going to, you know, it's hard to make money or support a family on, you know, a prosecutor's salary. And so I made the choice to go into private practice. I'm entrepreneurial by nature, and I like working for myself or working with a few partners and be able to make my own hours and do my own thing and not have to answer any, anybody in a bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. And so I went into private practice. In the first few years, uh, I did what basically what you're saying, and that is public defense work in a, as a private lawyer. So when you first go into practice as a, as a criminal defense lawyer, and you're trying to make your name and build your practice up, uh, your retained clientele, you often start by accepting assigned cases. So these are cases of people who are indigent. They, they don't have the funds uh, to be able to hire lawyers. And so the court appoints you uh, on an hourly basis to represent these people and you get paid up. Back then, out of court was $25 an hour, in court was $40 an hour. Wow. So it was less than even then what car mechanics were making. But it was an opportunity to, to be in court, to try cases, to be able to meet the judges. And I did a lot of work in Manhattan at that time. So I was accepting lots of assigned counsel cases while I was building my retained practice. And because I was a, a bigger guy, and, and I, as you know, I, I worked my way through college as a personal trainer, a nursing home orderly, and as a bouncer throwing people out of clubs in the South Shore of Long Island. So, uh, so I was a, a big guy and I had a certain set of skills. And so uh, a particular set of skills is, is Liam Neeson. So, and so, uh, so judges would assign me clients, indigent clients who had had prob- problem clients, who had, had problems with their, their lawyers. So particularly people who had maybe threatened their last lawyer or attacked their last lawyer, tried to hurt their last lawyer. Uh-huh. And I would walk into a courtroom and a judge would go, oh, Mr. Collins, you've come step up to the bench. We've got a, a client waiting for you in the pens in the back. He'll be very excited to see you. He attacked his last three lawyers. We think you'd be the perfect person to represent him. His trial is on for next week. So prepare yourself and you'll be sitting with him for a week trying his, his violent felony. So, so I did a lot of those, those cases. And I represented many people who had done things that, that were not, you know, not good, you know, clearly. Um, and the reality is that as a criminal defense lawyer, you know, yes, you do often get the question, you know, how can you defend those people, right? I mean, you know, they're, they're guilty. How do you defend a guilty person? Right. And the answer to that is actually very simple. It's easy. It's easy to defend a guilty person. It's hard, it's incredibly difficult and challenging and exhausting and anxiety producing to represent an innocent person. Because mm-hmm. the reality is the system is designed for the guilty. Most cases, 95 to 96% of cases are resolved by some type of mutual settlement, a plea agreement of some kind or a dismissal if the evidence isn't there. Very, very few cases actually go to trial. And the public may think that you know, all cases go to trial or there's yeah. a lot of cases where you're, you know, you're doing your you know, law and order routine in a courtroom, but those, those are actually fairly rare because most cases are disposed of in these other ways. And so your mm-hmm. job as a defense lawyer in many cases, not all, uh, is to try to figure out you know, the best possible result that you can get for a client. And it may be that people are often overcharged they're charged with things that they shouldn't have been charged with. They're charged with enhanced penalties that shouldn't be there, or there's mitigating factors. And, and a lot of the people, realistically, there are some really bad people in the criminal justice system for sure, but most of the people have some type of issue, whether it's drug addiction, alcohol abuse, diagnosed or undiagnosed mental health, mental illness issues. Um, and so it, some people would benefit from rehabilitation, from some type of uh, education. Many people have, have 
you know, had all sorts of reasons for why they are where they are. And as a defense lawyer, your job often is to present those things. Obviously, there are situations where a person is actually innocent. And we've seen enough of that because the Innocence Project, I don't remember, I think we're, we're up in the triple digits now of people who were sitting in prison for years and years, many of them on death row, mm -hmm. um, who were later found to be absolutely innocent, exonerated by DNA evidence, factually 100% innocent of the charges and they were about or soon to be executed. So, so the system's far from perfect and defense lawyers play a pivotal role in making sure that as much as humanly possible to eliminate those things from ever happening so that you know nobody wants, if you've got an innocent client and the prosecutor thinks that's a guilty client, you're in a bad situation. That is going to be a fight because the system is designed to move everybody through to a plea and a sentence. That's kind of the way it works. And as a defense lawyer, when you are throwing a monkey wrench into that machine, you are you're against all the forces of the criminal justice system, which are which are massive. And the, and the defense lawyer is really the, you know, the, the lone ranger that fights for justice in those cases, as well as in cases even where you have somebody who's guilty. And yeah, I don't understand how that's possible, because I I've always believed, and I'm sure most people assume, because we're told in America you're innocent until proven guilty. We're told that the burden of proof is on the prosecution to prove the guilt of the defendant. And there has to be a preponderance of evidence to support the prosecution's charges. So I don't understand how so many innocent people can be you know, found guilty. Yeah, and, and the reality is I, I've seen it. The system is, is limited by you know, human error, for mm -hmm. sure. You know, and so you can have an eyewitness who is mistaken and misidentifies somebody. And I've had a few cases where a person was charged based on their appearance, and it was later found without doubt that it was somebody else who did that crime. And, and in one case I can think of, it was a situation where it was actually on video. And in looking at the video the first time, I was like, this guy's got to be kidding. It's clearly him on the video. Yeah. Um, and then later, as I investigated the case, I was ultimately able to find that it was somebody who looked almost exactly like him. But when you ultimately saw the picture of that person and looked at the video, you were like, oh, oh, yes, this is the guy. And he had and the client had actually I was assigned. it was actually it was an assigned case. And I was assigned after I was maybe the third lawyer on the case. Um, but I was able to investigate it to the point where I brought it to the prosecutor and the prosecutor agreed, oops, we made a mistake. Let's let him out of jail where he's been sitting for eight months for something that he did not do. Wow. Um, so it happens. Hopefully it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Um, most of my cases, you know, now uh, are, are in the field of sports nutrition and dietary supplements and steroid defense cases and growth hormone and SARMs and all of that stuff, because personally, I like that stuff. And I'm at a point in my career where I can, I can kind of choose, choose what I do. And so, um, so that's kind of what I focus on. But I still take some cases that are outside the scope of, you know, that stuff, because look, I've got the experience. I tried robberies and, and burglaries and, you know, drug street level drug transactions and you know handled homicide cases. So I've got all that experience. I don't have to take those cases if I don't want to, but my, my partners do a lot of bread and butter criminal defense work. But recently, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I, I was contacted by one of the people who uh, is accused of entering the US Capitol on January 6th. Mm -hmm. So um, look, putting aside the politics, putting aside how you feel, how either of us would feel about, you know, what happened that day. Everybody deserves a defense. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the case is interesting and it's part of, of history. And so I considered, you know, will I, will I take this case? And I have a friend who's an attorney, a experienced lawyer um, who said to me, you're thinking of taking that case? Are you out of your mind? I said, <laughs> why? You know, well, uh, you know, 
how will that reflect upon your firm? And this is a lawyer saying this. This is yeah. not a lay person. Hmm. And I was like, how will it re reflect on my firm? My firm accepts cases. We've represented child pornographers and you know sex offenders and you know people who've committed all sorts of violent crimes. Um, that's that's what criminal defense lawyers do. How would this be any different? And she was so clouded by her own political ideology that she could, you know, she couldn't even grasp the idea that no lawyer should ever be judged by a client. We accept the clients who deserve and need our representation. And you know, that's kind of what you, you do when you take the oath to be an attorney and, and you would adopt a, a practice as a criminal defense lawyer. So, um, so it occurred to me that if she felt that way, then you know how how are lay people who don't really understand the ethical obligations that lawyers have to fight to fight hard on behalf of your client regardless of what that client is alleged to have done and whether that client is innocent of the charges and surprisingly there are folks like we've talked about who are in fact innocent or whether that person did it and understanding why they did and making a defense based on those things so uh so i you know i've been asked enough times how can you defend those people and, and I wanted to give an answer to it in a column and then spend a little time with you talking about it so that you as a lay person can ask me the questions yeah. uh, that you have. Yeah, because you, know, you just brought up a good point that it, to me, it seems so ironic. You say, uh, as an attorney, you have an ethical obligation to represent someone who's been charged with a crime. But I think in the public mind, if we see uh, someone who's accused and there's, there's, a, there's a good amount of evidence, that this person did commit some heinous acts. Maybe it was child pornography. Maybe it was child rape, murder. This person is, is hated. We're viewing them as vile and evil. So we think ethically, nobody should represent them. They should just be left to flounder and maybe represent themselves on the, on the stand because you're helping, you're, you're helping an evil person try to get away with murder or rape or something like that. So in, in my mind, in the public mind, I think that's that's the way we're looking at it is ethically, you have a responsibility to not defend someone who's vile and evil and despicable. It, yeah, it, and it's interesting, you know, in the abstract, I, I can see how the public can think of it that way. But when you, in the actual practice, the person who's thinking those in those terms in that way, yeah. when Uncle Billy gets arrested for drunk driving and or when little Jimmy in his college dorm is is busted because he's selling weed out of his dorm room yeah. or when you know cousin Floyd is arrested and charged with something heinous that you know in the abstract you would say oh that's terrible suddenly those folks are in my office and all of that stuff that you just mentioned will, goes completely out the window mm -hmm. and they are like please you need to defend this person. He needs your help. So, you know, it, it's interesting how the tune changes when it becomes personalized. And then suddenly it's like, ah, I get what you do now. Everybody is entitled to a defense. And there may be some cases that a lawyer could ultimately choose for whatever reason. I could see how maybe a, a, a lawyer who had been herself the victim of a sexual assault would choose not to take sexual assault cases for that reason. I, I get that, yeah, but yeah. but by and large, lawyers are obligated when a client comes with a case that's within that lawyer's expertise. And a lot of the cases that I handle are in a very narrow wheelhouse of, of my expertise. Right. And right. you know, for me to send them away, um, if I think that I'm I can do a good job to help them and that I have the skills and experience to be able to do the best for them, then, then I, as I see it, that's what lawyers are supposed to be doing. Yeah, because it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's a dichotomy that we have this criminal justice system that most of the time we're in support of as Americans. But then when we see something so vile, so, so such, a, such an atrocity, say, let's go back to Jeffrey Dahmer 40 years ago, whenever it was, right. you know, they, they found pieces of bodies all over his apartment in the refrigerator. It's, he was clearly guilty of many, many homicides and horrible acts. So we see him on the witness. Or we see him 
in the in the courtroom with his attorneys and we're you know i i, I can remember as a, as a kid i was probably 10 or 11 years old at the time saying those bastards those bastards they're <laughs> trying to they're trying to get this this evil scumbag free you know i i i just i i i feel bad for the defense attorneys sometimes because i think they get a lot of that misplaced anger and, a, and aggression and emotional baggage that should be reserved purely for the client but you know, we right. think you're an alliance and we're, we right. think you're trying to help them get away with murder or trying to set them free when, you know, it's, right. it's I know it's not accurate and accurate. Well, the, 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 the two things are, number one, you know, it's easy to cherry pick the most egregious, horrendous, you know, open and shut case and then extrapolate that, that that's, that's typical of the criminal justice system. That Jeffrey Dahmer is not typical <laughs> of the criminal justice system. The vast majority of cases are people who make the majority of cases are people who, because of poverty, stupidity, mental illness, drug addiction, whatever, do terrible or sometimes just stupid things and wind up in the criminal justice system. Yeah. And, and sec the second thing is we've created an adversarial system. The system is designed so that there's a judge and on either side, there's a defense attorney and there's a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And if the case is as open and shut as, as you're you know, postulating, and the evidence is so strong and so clear, then the prosecutor, if the prosecutor does his or her job, is going to win. And the person is going to serve a sentence that is commensurate with what that person did. That's how the system works. And the defense lawyer, no matter what the, the skills and experience of the defense lawyer, we sort of, the system is based on the idea that the the right result is going to come out of two experience, two two gladiators enter the ring, and one has truth and justice and the facts and the evidence and the witnesses, and the other has none of those things on their side. Yeah. The result should come out right, and it but it only works if both are fighting their hardest and both are doing their jobs. The end result will be what the evidence and the witnesses and the proof shows in a case. That's how we've decided to make our system work. And in order for that system to work, you can't have one side you know, presenting all of that and the other side fighting with one hand behind the back or pulling some punches or anything like that. Both have to fight their very hardest. And in that battle, the truth based on evidence and facts will win. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm glad you explained it because I've I've been on that uh, my whole life. I've always looked at defense lawyers kind of as shady people. So no offense, but only in the only in cases where it's so heinous. Like I just saw a case where he was convicted. Some some man in L.A. had taken out insurance policies on his wife and his two autistic sons a few couple of years before, and then he he staged uh, a fake car accident that he escaped from and they died. And collected all the money and he, he got convicted not, good, not good facts yeah yeah he was the i don't think that uh, that attorney ever had a chance to to do anything but maybe save him from the death penalty i don't know if they have that in california and there may be cases where where that's that's the fight but mm -hmm. whatever the fight is the the appropriate fight in a case you've got to do it with all your heart you've got to do it with all your skills and all your experience and and all your zeal and that's in you know that's what we do as defense lawyers, and in that battle, the result comes out. Yeah, and I know in your career, you've represented so many people in our industry, and uh, you've helped a lot of them get out of some jams that a lot of times I think they were being unfairly targeted, or, you know, there were, if, if you guys read the book Legal Muscle, which I highly encourage you to get the book and read it, Rick lays out some scenarios in their real life situations that will boggle your mind as far as the things that the things that were done by prosecutors in various states and you'll see how it's not as cut and dry as it seems it's not it's not prosecutors are the good guys and the defense attorneys are the bad guys it's it's not many times it, it's actually quite the opposite but uh, i once had a case uh, of a few years back um and i won't say who it was it was somebody i was uh, my adversary was a prosecutor who went on to become a very very well-known public figure and he was a very good lawyer and he had it was a a case that involved, it was a retained case that involved some sort of union malfeasance and, and improprieties in, in union financial issues. Um, and the prosecutor 
thought that the case was an open and shut case and, and told the judge, this whole thing is cut and dry. And, um, and I proceeded to you know, present my side of things to question uh, his evidence. And ultimately it went poorly for him, very, very poorly. And we took a mm -hmm. break and he had this uh, intern that was working with him in, in his office. And the intern, I guess, was impressed of how I had handled the case. And uh, we all happened to be in the bathroom at the same time. And uh, I was washing my hands and the intern <laughs> said something like, just looked at me and went, wow. And, and I said to him, the whole thing is far from cut and dry. And I, and I saw the head snap up from where yeah, the, the prosecutor was standing as I walked out of the, the bathroom and it, it went my way. So sometimes what appears to be a completely open and shut case, and, and I've told the, the story and maybe another day we'll talk about it, of a case I had out in the West where a female high ranking NPC bodybuilder was accused of selling one vial of testosterone ester to an undercover um, snitch who was working off his own case. And the evidence appeared to be absolutely open and shut, open and shut case to the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, she was 100% innocent of the charges wow. completely. Um, and I was able to ultimately prove that essentially to, to establish it. And, um, and the case was ultimately dismissed. Um, but, you know, not having an aggressive lawyer, not having a lawyer who's there to fight for you. You know, if I take a case, I'm fighting. Uh, you know, uh, I, I look at lawyers, criminal defense lawyers are modern day gladiators. We go into the arena, we're, we're you know, often out, out, powered by the resources of the state or the government uh, beyond what we have. So we have our skills, we have our zeal, we have our aggressiveness and we go into fight. Which doesn't mean that I don't like to negotiate and, and I think anybody who's been my adversary would say that, I'm, that I handle myself with, with class and dignity and try to resolve cases in a way that is fair. But um, when the gloves, you know, when it's time to fight, you know, I, I'm in there to fight. Yeah, well, that's why steroidlaw.com, people, I suggest any of you who might ever need representation, even if you don't think you do, get the firm phone number in there, store it in your phone. Hopefully you'll never need to call it, but if you ever need help, my goodness, I, I can't think of anyone else, anyone else in the world I would want to, I would call first other than Rick Collins and his Thanks, Esquire Ron. and his partner. Yeah, so, yeah, keep me on speed dial. I, I love helping people with, whatever their legal problems are. Obviously I represent a lot of supplement companies on their various issues and a lot of bodybuilders and, and fitness people on a whole variety of legal issues. So if you need me, call me. Yeah, great. And that'll do it for episode two of Legal Muscle starring Rick Collins Esquire. Thank we you. Don't do these every week because they're special, but the next one's going to be pretty, pretty great too. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate you taking the time very much, sir. Thanks, Ron. See you soon. And everybody, we'll see you next time.